talk about things that are important to the theater, to talk with brilliant writers, theater makers, um, two of whom are some of my favorite people on the planet. Um, and I'd like to introduce you to them. So today we're going to talk with Octavia Solis. Hi, Octavio. Hi, how are you? And Kate Hamill. Hello, Kate. Hi. Um, so we're talking today about adaptation, how to write it, how to uh, conceive of it, how to go about like actually putting somebody else's words into your words, into a new form, all of that. Um, we're, we're very excited to chat with those of you watching online about questions. Um, but I always like to kind of start these things with a sense of how do you become who you are? Um, what is your brief but fabulous journey um, to being the playwright that you are? And Kate, I'd actually love to start with you because I think for a long time, the theater world knew you as an actor. Um, and so I'm really interested when writing came into your self-definition, how did you come to that? It has always been there. Um, yeah, so tell us a little bit about how, how you got to be you. Yeah, I, first of all, I love the question, how did you get to be you is a really like, I feel like I ask myself that every morning. Uh, yeah, um, I started out as an actor, I got my degree in acting and um, I was doing like, okay, I was working and I was sort of doing the natural, the normal actor gig thing. And uh, I found myself in this frustrating situation. This was like circa 2010, um, where I was constantly in these rooms with 100 other women or 200 other women. And they would always be auditioning to play someone's, the male character's wife or girlfriend or prostitute, like they had no relationship to the female characters that I, female people I knew in life. And uh, they weren't funny. They didn't have any complexities. They were always like, their main appeal was the male gaze. So it was always like how likable they were, how sexy they were, or how whatever. And um, at the same time, a bunch of people from my, that I knew that was like many conservatory programs, I was in, um, there were more women than men and the women were just dropping out left and right, like designers, directors, um, even uh, like from all sorts of the spectrum because there was just not enough work for them. And I'm a, like a feminist person. So I was um, frustrated that these stories were explicitly not, not only like not feminists, they were sexist often, um, or upholding a sexist worldview, and that there was no work for women in the way that I wanted to see. So um, I bet I had always written some, I had a day job copywriting, which is um, not fun, but does teach you to meet deadlines, you know, like catalogs and websites and stuff. And I taught writing for a little bit to um, middle schoolers and high schoolers, which actually was good practice to learn like structural things. And so I had always written a little bit and um, I had written a couple of short plays and I bet my friend a hundred dollars, my friend Andrew Snickles, um, who I think you know, uh, I that I, I could, <laughs> I love Andrus, that I could write um, a new feminist classic, which was going to be Sense and Sensibility. And that was my full length, first full length play. And that was 2011. And since then I've just been, you know, it just became this whole hybrid career, much to my surprise when I started off I really was like, no one will ever want to see this. I just don't want to give Andrus a hundred dollars. <laughs> Cause I was really poor at the time. So a hundred dollars to me was like, am I going to be eating Look, that ramen? Is a, yeah. that, that is a worthy, that is a worthy pursuit. Yeah. Um, that's amazing. That's, that's absolutely amazing. And we'll talk a little bit later about kind of why Austin, why that and all the hows, but thank you for that. Amazing. Octavio, sure. tell us, who, how do you get to be you? Well, I also similarly started out as an actor. I was stage bit when I was cast in high school in the production of uh, The Diary of Anne Frank. And from that moment on, I never looked back. I always wanted to be an actor. So I, I went to college training programs in San Antonio, Texas, and in Dallas to train for that over seven years of undergrad and grad. Uh, when I hit the sidewalk, when I started pounding the sidewalk, and my intention was to move to New York 
but my car was stolen and I suddenly just needed funds. So I stayed in Dallas longer than, than I anticipated. But um, uh, I, I started, I was offered a, a, a teaching job at the Booker T um, uh, High School, or rather Arts Magnet High School at Booker T Washington uh, High School. And, uh, and they wanted me to teach playwriting. And I, and I found that really strange because I said, I'm an actor, I'm not a playwright. But I had been taking some playwriting courses uh, at the Dallas Theater Center, and he had recommended me. So I said, well, I better, you know, bone up on this, <laughs> read some more plays, <laughs> get some manuals, and really, really start uh, working on this, because uh, I needed the job. Um, but I started getting into it. It was be it was part of my own re-education into all this, because I've been taking playwriting courses ever since I was there as a, as a freshman, but I never really paid that much attention to them, because I was going to be an actor. And then at some point, uh, it, it clicked. Um, and, and I also was trying to maintain an acting career in Dallas, and it was just really hard. I couldn't get into, couldn't get anyone to take me seriously or see me. So I started devising my own, um, I started writing my own pieces, my own short plays that I could then showcase my acting in and, and performing them, not in theaters, but in uh, punk clubs and new wave clubs that I worked in as a bartender. So uh, I just did it myself. I said, I'll do it myself. I said, the stage isn't used on Wednesday nights. I started this program from the ground up called uh, Words on Wednesdays. It was a poetry reading program uh, that got quite a bit of attention in the two years that I ran it because it was every week. I paid the poets uh, out of my own pocket, uh, you know, actually $20. Oh, that's a like hundred, a hundred dollars? <laughs> no, 20, 20 bucks. <laughs> and an open bar. <laughs> and a lot of them wanted to do it just for the open bar. <laughs> yeah, duh. <laughs> um, and, and then I, I thought, and, and I was getting calls from like San Francisco, Lawrence, Kansas, Austin, from poets saying, you know, I'm gonna be coming through there. Can I read? And I said, sure. Uh, and it was, and they would get a huge crowd. It started small, but it got really, really huge, like over 100, 150. And then I had the idea of doing like every sixth Wednesday, a play of mine. But because it was poetry oriented, I said, they have to be written in verse. So I wrote my own verse pieces. I cast myself in it. Uh, and the pieces got a lot of attention and they were in the paper and the newspapers uh, locally, but they were all about the writing and I didn't get enough attention as an actor <laughs> for these. Uh, and I kind of got the hint. I said, I'm an actor. I think I'm a writer. I think I'm a playwright. And I took that seriously. I said, I'm not even going to continue two careers, because it's just like, I have to focus. So I gave up my acting career. Uh, the chops never go away. They get rusty, but they never really go away. Um, and I devoted myself to, to being a playwright. And uh, once I did, then things started happening like that. Yeah. And within a couple of weeks, Maria Irene Fornes called me, asked me to participate in her program at INTAR. Um, uh, had a play that was read in, a, in at the um, Hispanic Playwrights uh, Project HPP at South Coast Repertory back in back in the day, like 1989. You know, <laughs> that's a long time. But uh, but it worked. You know, that sort of set me on my journey, and I haven't looked back since. That's awesome. I I too found theater through acting. I think a lot of people do because it's the kind of most obvious entryway. And then learning kind of, oh, you don't make up what you say? Oh, <laughs> got it. <laughs> oh, wait, so wait, who writes what you say? Because I want to be that person. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wait, no, they write the ending too? Oh, yeah. okay. Now I know what I want to do. <laughs> and then I realized also that as a, as a playwright, I had more power. So much power. So much power. I'd like I, power. You know, I, 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 I could have. Um, and that was very satisfying as well. Um, uh, this, uh, this, there's something that, that happened to me though that really clicked is uh, I was working on one of my plays and I was really into it. And my agent called me and said, I have you an assignment to, to go for an audition. It's in half an hour, you gotta go now. And I went, oh, and it's for a commercial, beer commercial. And it's gonna, it's a national one. So you could get a lot of money. So I went, all right, I'll go. So I was annoyed, but I went, I walked in there. I saw 20 guys, 30 guys that looked like me, except more handsome, more buff, younger too. Uh, although I was a kid, um, and um, 
I got the side and it was a Spanish language course commercial and it was two, three lines. It was just lousy. And I looked at it and I memorized it. I said, I got this. I'll, I'll probably get it. And if I don't, I don't care. But then I looked at these guys and they were all looking at it like it was, you know, Hamlet soliloquy. They were really just focused on it. They wanted this job that badly. And I said, you know, this is unfair. If, if, why, why am I here? If I get the job, um, I don't really care. I want to go back to my play. But to them, it means everything. And I said, you know, they can have it. <laughs> I, I, I didn't go to the audition, didn't do it. Yeah. And it wasn't because I disrespected the, the, the process, because I actually I had before, but I respected what they were doing a lot more after that, um, because they were, they, they, to them, it meant everything. So I said, they can have it, but I'm going to write plays for all of these brown young men to perform so that yes. they have something else to do, you know, besides, you know, Spanish language commercials, which is fine. It's great. We all need that gig. Yeah. But, but that's the writer. power, right? That's the power of the, of the writer is going, I, for me, it was, I don't see any roles for me. I don't see any roles for any woman except, I mean, it's, it's the, it's the Gertrude Ophelia paradox. Like, yeah, that's, exactly. that's it. That's it. Exactly. We're that's done. It. <laughs> oh, God. The, um, the virgin okay. whore. Yeah. <laughs> but, exactly. but sometimes, sometimes, sometimes a comical spinster. Sometimes virgin a comical whore, spinster. Comical but, spinster. Virgin whore usually both of them die in that, in this case. So like, both of them kick it by the end. And you're like, really? Nobody? Oh, okay. Where's her mom? Where's anyone's mom in Shakespeare? Let's be honest. But, you know, so I, I, I that, that is kind of similar to my, my journey of going like, well, if nobody else is going to write them, I guess I'll start writing them. <laughs> yes. um, and then you grow and you grow and you grow and, and realize to your point, Octavio, just looking around at the people that you respect and the stories that you know are valuable and worthy and like, put those on stage, like make way, <laughs> new stories coming through. Um, so we're here to talk about adaptation, which is such an interesting uh, corner case for playwriting because it is your play, but it's also somebody else's story and it can be both and happily mingle. Um, so I'd love to maybe, if you could talk, I know Kate, you have, I mean, a library of these adaptations at this point, um, but a lot are kind of European classics, American classics. Um, and Octavio, if you could kind of tell us a little bit, let's start with Octavio, t tell us kind of what one or some of your adaptations um, are, just so we kind of know what we're talking about. I'm thinking of course about Quixote for you, Octavio, but yeah, maybe tell us a little bit about it. Uh, most recently, uh, although it started, the journey started way back in 2005, um, 20, 20, 2006, uh, but I started uh, writing an adaptation of Don Quixote, which is Cervantes' masterwork, considered the first modern novel. And, um, and so I've worked on that. Uh, but I've also did, I was, even before that, I was asked by Cal Shakes and um, Word for Word to adapt uh, an early novel of Steinbeck's called The Pastures of Heaven. Uh, which is really interesting. Uh, and I'm, I wasn't a big Steinbeck fan now, uh, then, but I am now. And uh, so I, those are the two that I have. Um, the Quixote journey was really, really interesting um, because it's, it's long. I, I did it initially as a, as a commission for the OSF. And before I launched, in it, launched into it, I asked them, what do you want? Do you want an Octavius release play? Or do you want a historical costume drama that is more or less close to the novel? And they said, the latter. We want something for our outdoor stage, for our huge audiences of kids. And they bring, you know, school, uh, teachers bring their kids and they're all studying the novel. So something like that. We don't want you to go too crazy with it. I went, all right. And so I, I, I attempted that. Um, I read two different, two different uh, translations, one by Thomas Smollett, who's... Uh, um, it, it's it's uh, uh, an acknowledged masterwork as well uh, for its translation. It's I think it published in 1778 or something like that. And then a more recent one by Edith Grossman, uh, who is a master translator. She's done a lot of uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez's novels uh, and did one that is highly acclaimed that came out, I think maybe 1999, 2000, something like that. Both of those were really um, my touchstones. Um, but adapting the novel and a novel of that epic scope and an epic size 
was a real challenge. Um, um, I'll stop there so we can then hear from Kate because I have so much more to say. So much more. To, I know. I want. I want to know the next part of that story because I. <laughs> I know it's. It's a good one. So Kate, tell us kind of where did you? What What's the source material? What when you're thinking about these translations? Where do you? What's your? I mean, I come. I I come from sort of a radical adaptation place. I kind of think of them. I think of them as I come from a new play perspective when I was an, I mean, I still act, but um, when I was just, when I was just an actor, excuse me, when I was an actor solely, I uh, did a lot of new play work. And so that's just where I go. And I also am very interested in using the vehicle of old stories to um, sort of, I'm not interested in like, decorating the doors of the castle. I want to kind of kick them down and let all the people in, like make them highly theatrical, make them works that exist apart from the original. Um, I kind of think of it as a collaboration between myself and the original author, whether or not that original author is currently dead. Uh, spe specifically feminists dealing with like class issues I'm very interested in um, and uh, inclusive and very much um, trying to make them speak to the issues of the day. So uh, yeah, I also come at it from a place of um, this is me meets this material and sometimes it's going to be way more me and sometimes um, in a weird way that's where my copywriting back sometimes I'm trying to sort of seamlessly you can't tell who's me and who's Thackeray or whatever and sometimes I'm like this is very clearly me when they say uh, balls, 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 I cannot get enough of them in Pride and Prejudice. I'm not trying to make you think that is Jane Austen, that is Pride and Prejudice, but I'm, I'm very interested, especially in the time when we are re-examining all our structures and who we make the heroes of our story and um, what we kind of believe in as canon and as a classic. I'm really interested in just like pushing that, pushing that, pushing that. Uh, so I started out with Jane Austen because Jane Austen um, is a woman. She writes women's stories. And at the time when I started my first one, the ma vast majority of stage adaptations of her work were by men. And that's like, fine, men totally have the right to adapt Jane Austen. But I was like, even this famous proto-feminist novelist everything is through the male gaze. It's solely through the male gaze. That's bananas. So I started with her and I've been doing her novels in order, but I've done a bunch of like Homer and all this other stuff. And yeah, I, I just focus, I have less, I'm very interested in like epic stuff and, you know, sort of non-realistic worlds, um, language-based stuff. So uh, I kind of let that guide me and it's less about, you know, there was a time when everyone was like, well, you're the 19th century girl. It was like, yeah, not really. <laughs> I like sort of got in the, I, I was interested. So I got like, I had done a lot of research. So I wrote like four plays in that time period, but I was like, you know, I mean, I have a, like a labor play set in the, you know, like I, I'm very interested in that's more, when I'm doing adaptation, it's more like it has to mean something to me and I feel like it has to say something to the world right now. And I have to feel like, do I have a unique way to do this? Because if I feel like I'm just kind of repeating the same, like Pride and Prejudice was an interesting one because I was like, there are a million excellent adaptations of Pride and Prejudice. So I better make something that's, that are very like, you know, like, everyone if you know the novel you will know this play and i was like isn't it more interesting to make something surprising even if i get angry emails which i do um, so that's what i, <laughs> I well, mean definitely you know, do J jane you know, austen fans my favorite so fans fans <laughs> what's your favorite well my favorite one started out <laughs> dear miss himmel how could you all in caps <laughs> You that know, was about little women. I was like, woof. Okay. All right. But I mean, <laughs> see, this is what I love about adaptation, especially these kind of nostalgic plays or novels that the stories where we're like, I know what this is. Great. Oh, great. I can't wait. This is what 
we did a real kind of switcheroo for the folks for when I, the only real adaptation I've ever done besides a, a, a kid's play, one of my very first was, is last year's Peter Pan at Shakespeare Theater in DC. Massive production, big spectacle. But at, you see Peter Pan, he's flying on the poster. Every, it looks great, tw twinkly stars. Oh, great, I know this, totally. And you come in and it is this anti-colonialist, feminist, <laughs> like big old, you know, anti-male toxicity <laughs> play. And it's DC, right? <laughs> so we're sitting there with like the Supreme Court justice. Well, we got RBG, pretty cool, but then, um, John Roberts came too, and I was like, John, do you want to talk about what you saw tonight? <laughs> yeah, have a discussion about it. anyway. But it's this thing of when you have a nostalgic property, a really well-known, beloved character, I think that's actually where you can change people's minds and hearts the most because we're gonna go like here, Lizzie Bennett, but Lizzie Bennett with some like shit to do. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm going like Darcy. Is you Darcy have to, you not have to. Us? <laughs> You got to explode the expectations by exploding yeah. the novel. That was that was the I, journey that I that I had with with Quixote is that yeah. I was so reverential. I loved the novel so much, yeah. but I didn't even know how to get into it. I said, you know, uh, so I I tried to be faithful to it, and faithful just didn't work out at all. First of all, Quixote in the novel, it, it's called picaresque for a reason because all it's just a series of episodes and adventures that he goes through most of them interchangeable because our lead character doesn't really grow. He doesn't really learn from anything. He imitates it, he gets ideas from some encounters that he has and he may, may have a certain sort of like, oh, wow, I didn't know that. That's interesting. And then he goes on and doesn't apply it anywhere else. So he, he's, a, he's a character that sort of flatlines all the way through the novel. You can do that in a novel because really the, 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 it's about showing what the society was going through at the time rather than him. Uh, and then the other thing is that the chief male character, never female character, sorry, never appears. Dulcinea is constantly evoked. She's a muse. She's this icon, whatever, but she's not real. She never really appears as a person. And, and uh, I found that really, really difficult to actualize on stage. Um, and 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 also to give to write a character that doesn't grow, I tried to be true true to that, and so the play worked on some level and then failed miserably in other levels because it just I couldn't write uh, there was no central female character that could exist as anything else than quote unquote the virgin as we've been talking about earlier, yeah. and and the male character never grew and that really bothered my chief uh, actor in this. So I kind of put the play in mothballs after that. And then uh, a company, Shakespeare Dallas, asked me to um, adapt that to Texas and update it and put more Spanish in it. And I thought, well, OK, I can do that. That's easy. And so I just did it in a couple of months work. And But it was still the same play with the same problems. Um, but I was at least out of you know, 16th century, 15th century Spain. And, and those mores, and that could deal more with contemporary issues. And I thought, well, this is okay. But then Eric Ting at uh, Cal Shakes asked me, bring that play in, but you're gonna have to do some work on this. And he pushed me, he and uh, my director, KJ Sanchez, really pushed me to uh, explode the work. And uh, the thing that I realized I had to do, and this was actually Eric's suggestion is, you have to take that novel from Cervantes. You now have to rewrite it and make it yours. Yeah. I'm not interested in what Cervantes thought. I'm interested in what you're going to say. There we go. Um, and so I did. And at the time that I started doing all this work, that's when all the news was coming about, out about the, the building of the wall, the caging of children, the separation of families, the, de the mass deport deportations and raids that were going on um, with the Border Patrol and and Department of Homeland Security. And uh, I had to respond to that. I felt like Cervantes was responding to the issues of his day when he was writing the novel. And I said, I have to make that novel a vehicle for the things that are happening today. So once I did that, then I felt like, oh, I can get excited about this work because it's me. It, it, you know, I, I, when I did the first one, I was in Spain. The second one was at least in Texas. But then this third one was home. 
yeah. I was writing about home, about my little town uh, along the border that I was born and raised in. And it felt like, okay, now, now Cervantes is really, I'm, I'm really engaging with him. As, as Kate said, you have to make that, that playwright, even if he's dead, an active collaborator in your work. Mm -hmm. So right, that's so true. I mean, I do think that's exactly it. The entire point of adaptation is that it is now and it is you. You know, if people mm -hmm. wanted Little Women, go read Little Women. Like it's just not, don't yeah. literally read it as the book that it is. <laughs> and then you, you will, your expectations will be perfectly met. But in the theater, what is vibrant about it? What is new about it? And I think Octavia, one thing that you said true is, is exactly what I had when adapting Peter Pan. Peter doesn't change, that's the whole point. This hero, oh, he's so great. He can't feel anything, solves everything with violence, doesn't listen to anybody. And like, you know, just go, goes about his time, literally cannot touch another person or be touched. Cool, cool, cool. Great, great protagonist. <laughs> and doesn't learn anything. At the end, he's the same thing. Starts yeah. all over with Wendy's daughter, right? So I was like, well, first thing, that's terrible playwriting. Like you have your main character or the, the top group of the cohort has to change, has to learn. So that was actually the most radical change you know, besides making Wendy a scientist and giving Tiger Lily agency and like actual like saving the day at the end and, and you know, her Neverland being turned back over to, to her and her people. The actual biggest change is being like, Peter, you're going to have to learn a lesson. You're going to have to collaborate with the women around you and you're going to have to get shit together. <laughs> yeah. So it's true. Like, but that's a bad, that's me battling with J.M. Barry, kind of like you were like wrestling for the story with Cervantes. And I know Kate and your adaptations, it seems like you are kind of challenging Austin and then challenging Thackeray and being like, is this what you meant? <laughs> you know what I mean? One, one of the interesting things about doing adaptations specifically, um, besides that people do get really, I, I always, my favorite theater is when I go in and I'm surprised and I'm challenged. I, I don't particularly enjoy things when I'm like, you know, I went to go see Oklahoma and that was pretty much Oklahoma. And I'm like, I, you know, it's sort of the warm milk of theater does nothing for me. I, I, I just, it's not my taste. And I feel like you can only explore what interests you. So I explore what interests me. But one of the things I like about adaptation is these classics, they, it, these stories like Don Quixote, all these stories, um, they teach us about ourselves, their cultural touchstones. Like when I say he's acting like a Hamlet, everyone can go to some basic characteristics of that. So we're creating mirrors of ourselves. So being able to distort that, I feel like, and I'm being sort of idealistic, I guess, um, can create change, especially since people will come to see classics that won't necessarily come if you, like if I wrote, this is my, you know, the title of my big fat social justice play, you're not necessarily going to come it. But if I do I don't, like Little Women, my Little Women, spoiler alert, Joe's not straight because Joe's a gay icon. And I didn't want to write a Little Women where Joe like gives up her career for a man. So, and Alcott wasn't straight. And I was like, I'm just doing it, whatever. And people, people were upset, whatever. I, but I was, I was like, there are a million other uh, Little Women. And for me, I just got a puppy, so this is my analogy. It's a little bit like, you know when you're trying to get me give medicine to a dog and you put it in like a delicious little be meatball or a piece of cheese or whatever? It's a little like, you can get people in to see Peter Pan who are not, would not maybe come to see that thing and they get to like get their minds expanded a little. You can come exactly. and you can get people in to see it who maybe can learn some new things or it's just, I just have, I, I'm so, whenever I go see someone else's work, I'm always like, when I see stuff that sort of transcends genres and surprises me and I couldn't uh, you know, quite classify what it is, that's my favorite stuff. So I think adaptation is a really fertile ground for that because people come in with rigid expectations and if they can, if you can convince them to go along for the ride anyway oh like that is really exciting and you that know, it's it's interesting too because like barriers. what is the expectation we're giving to them that if it wouldn't be little women without it right it wouldn't be little women without amy and marmy like all, all of the people that you're right. like great i recognize all these i can't wait christmas christmas yeah. <laughs> 
cabin-ness, some like New England yeah. vibes, <laughs> lots about yeah. writing and storytelling. You know, it wouldn't be yeah. Quixote without some swords and some windmills and, you know, um, <laughs> the conversation about hopes and dreams and Dulcinea, of course. And, you know, th there's so much that we can say, see, this is, you're, you're welcome. We give you what you want. But there's so much that a writer can do, uh, just giving them what they want and then giving you what you want and doing what you and, and frankly, giving the audience what they don't know they want yet. Suddenly they see Joe and they're like, oh my God, of course she's gay. Well, duh. <laughs> it's always been there. You know what I mean? She's but, Alcott and Alcott was, yeah. Exactly. So I, I could go I could go in that thing for a long time. <laughs> in, in adapting Quixote, what I found uh, as I started to update it is that there were corollaries to almost everything that happened in the novel. I could find some modern corollary to that. Oh, cool. So, um, Windmills. Windmills, you know, uh, you, you find contemporary windmills now. But I exploded that idea as well. I said, I don't want a real, I, I don't want, you know, we've seen that. It's such a cliche. And frankly, all most people know of Quixote is that he was tilting at windmills. They don't read the novel. In Spain, everybody loves Quixote, but they don't read, they've never read the novel. It's, mm -hmm. it's like one of the most widely admired novels in uh, forever. But hardly anybody really knows it uh so i felt like i had permission to just you know dispense with the windmills and instead i brought a huge uh on stage a huge uh uh like those large air airships drones that they used to go move along the border big white cool. scary looking things i said what if he attacks that what if he attacks and brings that down then then i have uh something that is that would have been technologically uh, significant for uh, for today's age that also has what, what would have been an important then a windmill was a very vital part of technology in the in the communities there uh, and when he just is attacking one and trying to destroy it and tearing at the sails he's he's it's quite a transgression so I had to find a similar thing this way uh, using uh, and I use the drones for that that's so great. And see, I, this is what I what I think is so sparkly and carbonated about adaptation is you you know, um, there's such great meat already there, and you get to, I think a meat metaphor is not going to go very far, but anyway, <laughs> you get to like do all this new stuff. I'm a vegetarian anyway. I don't know why I went to meat, but, um, <laughs> but I also think um, wh what was your and. I often give the advice to young writers trying to kind of make a name for themselves to try adaptation because of the exact same things, Kate, that you brought up. People want it. They will buy tickets to it. They will go see it. They will program it in their place. So it is in some ways a great way to say, here's what I can do with the story you already know and trust and your audience knows and trusts. And so having that as an entryway as a young writer can be a way to start in a relationship with South Coast Rep or OSF or your local uh, theater, big and small and all sizes. So it's, it's one of those things that as you are learning and honing your craft, you can take a plot that already exists and that one that you love and have some affinity for and, and think you can, as we have dis discussed, collaborate with your favorite, perhaps dead writer. Um, and it, it's, it's a really great way to practice doing what you do, proving that you can do it and making a, a relationship that can be turned into, turn into good work. Um, I also really, I want to talk about, because you're all actors and I'm like a failed act, like I could act if it's like a part maybe just like me, <laughs> then I can nail it, but I can't, can't do anything else. But I, I too came from a, a place of wanting to be an actor and, 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 and feeling that mysterious glowing thing um, that, that you can get in, in live performance. And I wonder how that manifests in your writing because for both of you, I know that your work is just so vibrant and it's funny and it's muscular and it's like active. And those are things that I think actors know that's what makes a great part. That's what makes you go like, I wanna be in that play. I want that role. So I wonder if you find yourself thinking like an actor sometimes when you're writing or all the time or how does, how does that work for you, Octavio? All the time. I think, of, I think I'm acting all the, all the roles all the time. I have to have a separate studio from the house or my wife would be very frightened with all my yelling that I do and all the <laughs> crying and, you know, I just get, I get caught up. I read the lines uh, and act out the roles of all, all my characters. Um, having been an actor, I know that, that, I, that I want to be seen, that I want a director to know that what I'm doing is mattering. 
because I've been in place where uh, early on where I didn't get a single note. We did a run through. I didn't get a single note. And I get very frustrated with that. And I go, did you, did you see me? Do you have any notes for me? And the director would often say, oh, you're fine. You're fine. You're doing okay. But it's like, it's what I could feel as a subject underneath, underneath that is that I, I didn't, I, I didn't matter. It didn't matter what I was doing. I had no stakes in the story. So that's the first thing I realized that it, 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 as I write characters is that every character on there has to have stakes, high stakes. They have to matter in the story. If you take them out, the story is going to wobble and co collapse like Jenga, like a game of Jenga. And uh, and if they and if you and if you, you and if you took the character out of the scene or the play and the play is structure was still structurally sound. You didn't need that character anyway, and you're and there, thereby you're saving. Uh, yeah, you have one less actor in there, but you're you know you're you're you're, you're reserving them for a better role down the down the line. Um, so they have to have an arc. They have to have a story arc. Even the most minor character has to have a beginning, middle, and end to their journey uh, that we can see. Um, and, uh, and 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 because I write big plays and plays that have multiple characters, they often have to play various different parts. So there's that's a way in which they can sort of find the arc of, of their of their role in the whole piece. Uh, but generally, and that that's they have to have stakes. That's what I've realized about yeah. the characters. What about you, Kate? How does the actor in you work with the writer in you? Uh, well, it's interesting because I um, I still act and quite often I'm in uh, my own plays or at least some of them and um, I kind of think of the writer part of my brain is Dana and the uh, and the actor part of my brain is Zool. Like they're two different uh, creatures <laughs> and at one point at one, at some point in a run there is no Dana there is only Zool uh, uh, when I'm just in a run. Um, for me, I think what shaped me a lot as a playwright uh, was really wanting plays to be actor driven in terms of like text driven, um, that you can scale them up in terms of design, but they can be very simple, just like a couple of props and an actor, because I love in some ways when I go see th other people's work again, one of my favorite steps is just a reading, when it's just like a bunch of scans and it's just the actors and the words and what the director has told them to do. And they're creating it and the audience is filling in the gaps with their imagination. So because I wanna also move towards a more egalitarian and less hierarchical theater structure, I like to create ensemble based plays in which, because I've also been like third spear carrier from the left in a play and it's very disheartening, I want everyone to feel like, we have kind of the same amount of weight and all of us have to be with each other and there are no like stars here. Um, so that focuses me a lot. And I think like, you know, I think all playwrights, all artists have like their strengths and their weaknesses. I think <laughs> one of my strengths is I do like love actors. I tend to um, especially world premiere when we cast an actor, I like to write towards their energy. I really am interested in actors and that is something that's really interesting for me. My weakness is like, I'm not good at like timelines sometimes people or like sometimes specific settings because I do come from a place of like high theatricality. Once I was in a meeting with a set designer, lovely, lovely guy. And he went, well, where does this, uh, you know, scene take place. And I looked at him and I was like, on stage. <laughs> he meant, of course, like in a drawing room. So that's like, I'm not, I, whenever I go into a design meeting, I'm like, I trust you. You guys are the experts. I'm not super, I tend to think everything looks great. And like, des I'm less design oriented, but I'm more actor based. And that is just, I think that comes from being an actor and, um, being excited by part of being part of an ensemble is part of why I mean I love acting that's why I still do it but part of why I like to do it is it just makes me feel like I'm in the mix I'm never asking my cast to do something that I'm not doing too it's like if we have a bad house if the play is like not hitting that night I'm in the arena with you and going like 
you know, like, or if it's great, I'm there with you, you know, we're doing it together. But um, yeah, it's, I think that all comes out of being an actor and, you know, having the normal. One of the interesting things about being an actor, as we've all experienced, is you do feel powerless. So I do like to make actors feel powerful and everyone in a process feel like this is our play, our play, our play. Yeah. That's great. So when we think about taking your, the novel that let's say I want to adapt this, how do you choose which parts? I mean, it's like for Quixote, it's so long. <laughs> I mean, how do you choose, um, first, how do you choose a novel? I mean, it, some seem to be better, maybe Infinite Jest, maybe not, <laughs> or maybe, I don't know. Um, Ulysses, go for it. Sure. All right. You know, but what, how do you, how do you choose? And how, how, how do you decide what ends up in the play? What is, what's actable? What's theatrical? What's dramatizable? Um, you know, well, I, I always get that question about internal, external and all that stuff. Well, I didn't have, in both my instances, they, they were assignments. I was asked to, to come on board for these. Uh, and I resisted the first one greatly because I just thought, uh, Steinbeck, me, I don't see it. Um, but um, it was John Moscone was, was heading Cal Shakes at the time. And he said, just read it, just read it. We'll get it, we'll get the novel to you right away. I went, okay. And it was there that afternoon because he had uh he had a courier uh, a courier brought it to me. So I said, Oh, okay, I have to read this. And I said, I'll read it tomorrow. My wife picked it up and read it first and read it in a single sitting. And it's a it's a novel of short stories, kind of like in fact, it was influenced by Winesburg, Ohio. Um uh, is it Sherwood Anderson? Uh, I don't remember the author. Anderson, someone. Anyway, um, and um, and it's a, it's so it's a, a series of short stories, all kind of interconnected, that tell a larger story. And still, it's a slim novel. And she said, "You have to do this. You have to do this. This is so California. You got to do it." And I I listened to her. She's she's the wisest person in the room. Um, so I I read it, and uh, I likewise also was and trance with it I said sure I'll do it um but I was also working with uh with word for word on this and word for words uh whose entire canon is made up of short fiction or excerpts from novels that they perform word for word they don't work with playwrights um they had developed an unusual performance style that actually feels kind of Brechtian with the characters speaking of themselves in the third person um and so I have to I, I was conscious of that. And so I said, I have to employ some of that in this because I actually, we had permission by the Steinbeck, Steinbeck estate to use his, um, his text in the book. But then I wanted to create my own text as well and kind of make it almost invisible. In fact, I was getting credit for lines that he'd written and he was being commended when the show opened for lines that were my lines. So I said, okay, now we're actually quite seamless in that way. Um, but, um, but then, you know, uh, there were discoveries that we made about certain stories that just didn't quite fit in there. Um, and that was made through really workshopping. We did so many workshops and the company, the actors had a great deal of say in this. And so we, we, we lost two, two of the, the bookended scenes that, that, that were one taking place during conquistador times, you know, during the mission era, and then uh, ones that were far more contemporary. Uh, and we decided to focus only on the people in the town. Um, and so that went, that went into the decision for this. Quixote was a different matter because it's just, there's, there's an, an entire episode, an adventure, almost every other page, it, they last that long. And, and the tilting at windmill scenes happens like on page 50. So it's, it's over right away. And I said, well, I can't get it over with right away. Everybody's looking forward to that. So I had to move things around, but I read it and I wrote all those, uh, just a list of all those episodes that happened in the book and said, now I have to choose the ones that are going to be most theatrical that I can connect one to the other and, and tell a story. Also, something else with Quixote is there are at least four novellas in there that don't take place with Quixote at all. There are other characters with their own stories uh, and they're amazing. One of them is the story of Cardenio, which uh, ended up being a Shakespeare play. Shakespeare apparently has this lost 
Cardenio uh, play uh, that is based on one of the stories from, uh, from Cervantes' novel. And I opted to try to include one of them in there. And uh, so then I could have like a story of young lovers and, you know, the machinations and the tricks they play on each other and the tragedies, and all, you know, just the story of four young lovers. Well, um, that's, we presented that, but it, but it felt like it made the play unwieldy in the end uh, by the time I got to Cal Shakes. And it was one of those scenes, one of those large sort of uh, limbs of the play that felt like, oh my God, I can't believe it, but that I'm being asked to cut it. Yeah. And I looked at it and I says, well, you know what? I think I just have to trust them and trust this process. Um, so I lost it. Um, and, and, and I never missed it. This looks so wonderful. I just didn't miss it. I'm telling you, cutting, that's like how to be a playwright, learn to love cutting. <laughs> I know, it took out 35 minutes of the play. <laughs> Thirty-five minutes, an entire subplot. Wow. Because I just wanted to, I got so into that story, that's a novella, and it just felt like, you know, in the novel it works, but it's so superfluous in the play. It, it's like, in the end, I, ha I, I, I had to listen to the rules of the theater, rather, and, and, and drama, yes. dramaturgy, rather than the rules of writing the novel. That's exactly it, right? How do you, how do you deal with that, Kate? Um, you know, uh, first of all, I have like, I, I have this joke that like, I think one day we should do like a, a night that's just all the deleted scenes from a bunch of plays that like the stuff that you're like, that was awesome and nobody will ever see it. What a beautiful monologue I wrote that no one will ever see. But when I cut things, I'm very like, well, if I hate that, I can bring it back. I, I lie to myself every time. So that's very, very helpful. Um, lying, self <laughs> uh, uh, uh Yeah, you know, I took this workshop once with Paula Vogel, one of the great superheroes of the American theater um, at the Vineyard Theater. And she, it was with a bunch of playwrights in a room, uh, one of her bake-offs. And she asked, if you were going to write a play about Barack Obama, what would your inciting incident be? Like, what, where would you start it? And she went around the room and we all had different moments from his life. The moment of his uh, 2004 speech, the like when his, you know, um, graduating from college, like, and it was probably 15 playwrights and everyone had a different thing. It's just like, what speaks to you? And so for me, when I'm looking at a novel I'm, or a, a pre-existing work, I'm just like, well, what, speaks to me what sort of speaks to the question I'm asking or a theme I mean I just did a, a Dracula for classic stage company and I was like I had worked at, and it was a very fast commission it went from first meeting about it to first rehearsal in six months and I was like uh -huh. I mean it was a great I was really so like it was I was really happy and pleased and thank you classic stage for trusting me but I was like oh my god what am I gonna do there are bats and it's about vampires and they're wolves like I definitely had a moment of like I may have been too ambitious but then and it's because I kept battering against the beginning of the novel like the beginning of the novel is you know basically like Jonathan Harker rides off to Dracula's castle and it's a, and I was like I'm not interested in that at all but what I am interested in is the moment when Jonathan says goodbye to his wife Mina and Mina's stuck at fucking home in England doing nothing because she's a lady and she's like bye have fun on your homoerotic adventures with a vampire honey so it started that and it was very <laughs> It was very strange because it, it was very, um, I have a, a, a dramaturgical partner, um, a dramaturg I work with a lot, Kristen Leahy, who's like a dear friend of mine. And Kristen, it was it was really lovely to like, I bounce off ideas and she was dramaturg on Dracula and I bounce ideas off of her a lot and we just kept coming back to, and since it was such a fast process, I was like having to cut. It was again, like, I was like, I have to cut 40 minutes from this. And we kept on, I kept on thinking about deleting that scene and then being like, otherwise there's no there there for me. So we didn't cut it. And I think that's 
the you know the when you have a pre-existing story and like an you know Barack Obama's life is a pre-existing story anything it's all about like what inciting incident works for you and then anything else you're just losing because that doesn't go along with your sort of theme and sometimes you have to lose like amazing stuff and it sucks <laughs> i resent yeah. it furiously <laughs> bring back bring back the eight hour play <laughs> but, but hey, there's just a real important lesson there and that's that if uh that is that the playwright also has to stay invested in the work if you take out the stuff that that really you really care about that is a part of you in the story and that you lose that then you care a little less about yeah. anything else that's so, and the why so of it true. why this yeah. adaptation now why are you writing this adaptation now all of those questions have to be answered with an affirmative like because of this and if you don't have it then it's just a regurgitation it's just well let's have them walk around saying the lines instead of reading them on a book you know yeah. um, and finding i think but part of what what you said octavio is great to highlight too for those attempting to write a adaptation right now which you should do um is is what is what is the most dramatic moments what are the choices what are the moments of choice for the character it's like in any play i mean as you have watched enough of these classes um uh, certainly with me, it's all about what is a character defining choice? Who pushes them to make that choice? What circumstance is undeniable where the character goes, I have to make a choice now. You know, and that's it. all great novels have these and it's your job to sneak around them, find those, put them in the order that makes sense and figure out what is the novel about? What is it actually, what, what is the culmination? What is the point of this story? And you know, for Jane Austen, a lot of them are love story, love story, love story, love story, love story. How did, how did they know for real? They both know they love, but now he doesn't know anymore. And now she's told him a thing and I just go fix the thing. And then the thing, and then finally they're like, okay, you like me and I like you? Great. <laughs> like that's kind of the end of almost everything. But how do we get there and finding all those choice making moments, which in a novel can feel um, not necessarily passive, but but the idea of going, how do we explode those choices to a space of such physicalized drama that we want to see it? And you know, I always love the um, <laughs> the British novels of love because there can the explosion can be absolutely silent tension between two people, and often is. <laughs> and I have a question for you, then. <laughs> yeah. I have a question for you, uh, Lauren. What novel are you reading or have you read that you would like to adapt? Uh -huh. Oh my gosh. Okay. There's this novel um, called that is by one of my favorite writers. She's a Turkish writer named Alif Shafak, and it's called 10 Minutes and 38 Seconds in This Strange World. And it is the most breathtaking piece of fiction I've maybe ever read. Really? Um, it is. What's the title? It's called 10 Minutes and 38 Seconds in This. What, or three minutes, I have to actually, it's a bunch of numbers. And so I'm like, blah, 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 seconds in this strange world. <laughs> and it's basically this incredible novel about um, a prostitute who is found murdered. And in the 10 minutes and 38 seconds that her consciousness is still with her, she goes through the circumstances and loves and friends and all of the things that made her to this moment. But that's halfway through the novel. The first novel is called The Mind and then the second is called The Body. And so when her mind goes out, the second half of the novel is about her body. And it is, it, to me, the reason why I, I think of it is, as I'm reading it right now, and I'm just, I, everything Alif Shafak writes is, is absolutely incredible. She has a great TED talk too. Um, but the way, the leaps of imagine, I mean, it's, it is, it's like, it's like, um, it's like Marquez. It's like, it's, it's just this wild, magical way of thinking and just barreling through memories and jumping timelines and going back and forth. And it's like, it doesn't matter, but it makes complete sense. You know what I mean? It's just the flow of it is, is stunning. But the reason why I think about how cool an adaptation would be is it feels impossible to put it on stage. How the hell could you possibly put it on stage? But since we've evoked the wonder that is Paula Vogel, Paula Vogel's, one of her greatest contributions to American theater is challenging every writer to put something impossible in their plays. And so to me, that is the basis of so much of my playwriting theology <laughs> is there's very little that is actually impossible because theater is a magical place where we could, you could have a woman stand up and say, I just died. And these people just found me in a dumpster and uh, I have 10 minutes and 38 seconds. Mine goes, so I'm gonna tell it. I, oh. 
That sounds amazing. It sounds amazing. It's so good. That sounds, that's amazing. You should do it. Yeah, you should. Right. Octavio, I'm I'm actually talking. I'm on like the Zoom screen. You're below me, so I feel like I'm shouting down at you. What's a novel <laughs> you've always wanted to adapt? Well, I'm reading it now, ah. and uh, it's an amazing novel. It's called Year Year of Wonders by Gwendolyn. Um, oh gosh. You're wonder I think I've read this book. Bro, Is it a blue cover? I think Wendelin Brook. And uh, Year of Wonders. Year of Wonders. And it's about uh, um, a woman in a village in England in 1666 that has been ravaged by the plague. Uh, so it's a plague story. Uh, and, and about how the village has opted to sequester themselves from the world. No one can leave and no one can come in and people have to deliver goods by leaving them at the gate. And then there's exchange of money with a lot of social distancing because they just don't know how the plague is spreading. Um, plague air, they call it, or plague seeds. Um, and, uh, and, and it's about how uh, this village, particularly this woman Anne, how they uh, cope with like death all around them. Uh, it's powerful and it's so beautifully told. Um, marvelous writer who also wrote a novel called March, which is about uh, the father of uh, the March women in- uh, Oh yeah. Women. And uh, that one won the Pulitzer Prize. Um, so um, it, it's, it just feels so theatrical to me and it, and it feels like a, like a story we need to hear about now because of uh, the pandemic that we're living through. You I'm should write sure that one. <laughs> I, I'm not sure I'm the one for it, but I know that someone should. Someone should. Kate, what about you? What's what's in your mind, Hopper? My, bucket, your... my adaptation bucket list. <laughs> uh, I've always wanted to do The Grapes of Wrath. If anybody from the Steinbeck estate is listening, <laughs> it's a, I, I can't, I, to be honest, I can't get the rights. But um, I would really like to do it because um, I come from an area of, like, extreme rural poverty and um yeah i'm just very very interested in all that would be the grapes of wrath and trying to do it in a feminist way i just i also i i mean i love steinbeck i think like what an interesting writer he is. Um, east of eden yeah. favorite novel mm. Oof, yeah there That's is one so question that we've had before we go um fred asks do you approach an adaptation of a well-known story differently from a lesser known story know if I do. I don't think so. Do you? I mean, maybe if it's a super well-known story, the list of things that define it as that nostalgic beloved story is maybe longer because people know more characters or they know the setting or they expect top hats or they expect whatever. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it's it, in some ways, it's knowing its imprint in the world. Um, but I treat the, the you know, I, search for dramatic moments the same. Yeah. I, I think um, I, I think there's a, there's a kind of uh, uh, awkwardness or tenderness around the work that is already so familiar that you feel like oh you know here I go I'm I'm going to adapt this work and everybody it's the beloved work and and how, you know I'm going to get vilified for attacking it whereas a lesser known work by like maybe you know Dickens did many Christmas stories not just. Uh, mm -hmm. not just the one that gets staged all the time. If somebody tried to adapt that one and mess with it in however way, way they wanted to, there probably would be less, you know, outcry than trying to mess with, uh, you know, this. Uh, yeah, no one cares. Yeah. <laughs> They're like, do what you want. <laughs> like, like I was, I, I was asked by Playon, uh, the, the 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 company within a company of the OSF, to adapt the Shakespeare play. And I was dreading, you know, <laughs> the idea of doing Hamlet or Macbeth, uh, those because I would be afraid that that's, you know, the uh, the scholars would be sitting there watching the play with their book open, going, "Let's see how he how he fucked up this line." Excuse my language. Uh, that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, instead, uh, you know, I was assigned Edward the Third, or I picked it because it was on the list of remaining plays. I said, "I didn't know Shakespeare wrote." Edward III, what is this play? I don't know it. And I, I, and I, I picked it with the intention of addressing a play that I was almost positive no one else would know. 
So nobody would know, you know, how this particular line or that couplet uh, had been deliberately changed or altered by me in my quote unquote uh, translation of that work. Um, I think that that gives me a, a sense of like, well, uh, I can breathe a little easier. I can I have more elbow room to work with than, you know, the, the masterpieces, the masterworks. Yeah. That's yeah. I, I feel like, I, I mean, yeah, it's so funny because I feel like a lot of people think they know these things better than they do. Like they have like, they more like are remembering the nostalgia about it or maybe I'm being a little bit of a pain, but like the movie, like, I don't know, so many people have said to me, well, in Sense and Sensibility, why didn't you include that famous line, my heart is and always will be yours? I was like, because Emma Thompson wrote that line. Like I was like, you know, it's not in the novel. And people have argued with me and I was like, I will give you the that hundred dollars back if it's in the book. Cause it's not that like, but you're remembering the movie and you're mad at me because, but yeah, I'm, so, I'm sort of like a brat. So I, when I was in school, I was always getting in trouble. So the more well-known something is, the more like my brattiness comes up and I just want to like mess with it. <laughs> I just want to mess with it. Like, but this is the deal. like, I mean, especially for those, those, those works that are in the public domain, like go for it, mess with it and it'll make it more exciting it'll make it more su surprising you know you can uh, there's something about what is the heart of the novel like what's the spirit the intention of the work and i think if that if you are meeting that and having a conversation with the intention of the work then you can like set it on mars if you want <laughs> i don't know well that's why I, I wish oh i was gonna say i wish i had seen your peter pan lauren because i feel like <laughs> I love, especially the ones that are like, sort of like, who's read Peter Pan? But everyone's seen that, like, you know, the sort of like Mary Martin or whatever. Yeah. I What an exciting challenge to make something new. And my friend Isabella LeBlanc was in it. And like, but like how, she's so amazing. Uh, but like, I love that and I love, I like deeply respect you for taking on that challenge and would have loved to see because like, I want people, it's so exciting that people went in like, I'm gonna see tights and they go in and see something else. And they thought, definitely thought it was a musical. Like half the people were like, oh, so no singing. Oh, okay. Oh. <laughs> but it was interesting. I will say one one big piece of me even agreeing to, to, to adapt it was working with two incredible uh, indigenous cultural con consultants who every single thing in the script um, had conversation around it. And what does this mean to tell the story of an indigenous character, even though Jane Barry never met anyone indigenous, never even been to America. So it was a total white gaze f fiction of who Tiger Lily is, but finding the way the, to, the, to balance that to Octavio's point to speak to now, to speak to right now, like Dakota Access Pipeline, like a missing women and girls in reservations, like let's talk about it now. Um, and so Isabella was one of the, the really b b critical pieces of making that character something um, that we could all be really proud of. And, you know, literally we're in DC in a Trump administration <laughs> with Chief Justice John Roberts in the audience. And at the end, Tiger Lily, is Peter gives Neverland back to Tiger Lily and she's standing there being like, this is, here we go. Like it's a new, a new day is dawning. <laughs> and I just want to be like, zoom in on Chief Justice. <laughs> what is in your mind, sir? <laughs> and you know, also the thing that people need to remind themselves is that whatever you did in your adaptation, the original is still there. Yeah, it's totally. still there. 50 years from You'll now, burn it. we'll do something else with yes. Peter Pan. That would exactly. be as exciting. Exactly. And we'll I always, the people then as well. Um, I, I, do, I don't respond to like the angry emails about it that I occasionally get, but like, I'm always like, but if you don't like it, and I really mean this in a non-defensive way, you can write your own. Like you, you can, can write, it. that's the great thing about adaptation is you literally can write your own and make your own. And that's cool. There's room in the world for everyone. Yeah, exactly. Like your, your Don Quixote is not going to be anyone else's. It's yours. It's, yeah. and so. And we need a lot of them. We need them. Um, 
On that fabulous note, the hour is complete. Um, I could talk to you for many, many more hours. What a joy. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and your time today. Um, and thanks everybody for watching. And uh, if you have any questions about adaptation or specific things we didn't get to, throw them in the comments and we'll answer them at our leisure. Thank you, Laura. <laughs> thank, thank you, you so Kate. much. Of course. <laughs> what a pleasure. I could do this for hours. So no. fun. We'll, we'll, we'll find another time to do that over cocktails. It, it, All right. It's funny that the pandemic is, is the thing that activates these conversations now across the country. Mm. We could have oh, yeah. done it before. We could have. <laughs> and now we are. It's true. So, and now we many are. more conversations in the future. Thanks, everybody. See ya. Bye. Bye. Thank you.